How are you today? You alive? Glad you're a Christian? Look for, looking forward to an hour-long sermon? Pushing it, all right, pushing it, that's all right. I wanted to, um, you know, we pray, and we need to be praying for our world and what's going on in our world and all the time, but particularly now, that the gospel would continue to prevail in every land and every culture and that the church would prosper and grow. And as Mike was talking about, you know, that we would, uh, well, I'll talk about that in a minute. But anyway, so about being fishing. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, I, there's good news as well. And I'm going to pray for our world, and then I want you to hear a little bit of good news. Father, we want to lift up before you the, our world, that you would, first of all, we know that everything without the shadow of a doubt is in your hand. And we know that the arm of the Lord is not shortened, that he cannot move and do great things. And so we pray, Father, that your peace would prevail. As Paul said in 1 Timothy 2, the pray for kings and all those in authority that we may be able to live peaceful and godly lives in Christ Jesus. And that's what I pray for, that you would allow peace to prevail. And in that lack of hostility, that it would open doors for the church to prosper and grow. And we ask you, Lord, according to the scripture itself, in 1 Timothy 2, we pray for all those in authority that they may make decisions that make it possible for us as Christians to live peaceful and godly lives in Christ Jesus. We ask for your will to be done on this earth as it is in heaven. And that we as individuals would be people who follow your will and live it out and help other people to do the same. We thank you for your provision for this day. We ask you to forgive us where we have fallen short and to forgive those who have sinned against us. We bless your holy name. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Marilyn, I know I'm putting you on the spot, but it's good news. And she shared this with me this week. And so would you mind standing and tell them what you told me? Do you need a microphone? No. <laughs> <laughs> she said it. I didn't. And your son, remember? And my son. This is good. Yeah, 
know. So Mike was talking about being a fisherman, and of course he's also a fisher of men. And what Jesus has called each of us to be a fisher of, not just men, of course, that's a generic term, but a fisher of people. So, you know, this is good. We sow the seed. We were talking in class this morning. This is not the sermon. I'll get to it, uh, and I will do it too quickly. I won't take very long. But this is just good, and I only get you for a half hour a week, so, you know, i got to take advantage of this. So we were talking in class this morning, and this is stuff that you get that you don't already think about, and it helps arm you as a Christian to talk to non-Christians. If you can ask a person the question, because we are covering in class, in fact, who alone has the authority to forgive sin? In all of the universe, there's only one person who has the authority to forgive sin. And so when you run into somebody who doesn't like the church or they, they don't know much about Christianity or they're resistant or whatever, you, you, you need to, the, here's a question you can ask them. In all the world, who has the authority to forgive you of your sin? You know the answer, don't you? They said Jesus. What do you say? You're right. Yes. I just wanted to hear it. <laughs> so, so you have that opportunity. And those are some of the things we cover in class. But, you know, Jesus alone has the authority to forgive sin. He's the only person in the whole universe that can do that. Well, who can't do it? Everybody else. Okay? And so if there is, that, that's just a question that, that's just a powerful question. And that's a question that should be in your arsenal of things you can say to folks if they're resistant to Christianity and Christ and things like that. So, all right. Hey, before I get started, one more thing. I want to say a really good word to our musicians. Uh, I really appreciate what you guys are doing and ladies. Uh, these guys, the, the musicians particularly, that's just, they're just sickening uh, with their talent. <laughs> Uh, I, just, I don't, you know, they're just, I mean, uh, I was telling Doug, he's like a baseball manager. He's got a, util, like, you know, he can play different people, different positions. And it's, you know, and I really appreciate uh, the work that all of you are uh, doing up here on the platform. Do you? Uh, you know, and, and, they, and they work hard at their craft as well. Uh, like, for instance, Chris who played drums this week. Uh, he has a degree in music and worship, and here he, he came twice this week because he's playing an instrument that's not his primary instrument, but he does it very well. So he came twice this week to practice for the songs today, you know? And these guys, they're all, they spend time practicing and rehearsing and looking at it, and they all, you know, Jeff, Jeff's primary instrument is the guitar, and he's been playing drums for months, and doing a really good job of that, and just the willingness to take on responsibility and take on a new skill level, and that's just, I really appreciate all you guys and what you're doing, and that's, and Alex and Mike aren't even here today to hear these good words, so I hope you tell them, and, and, the, and the great thing about these guys, and Lord, I'm, I'm blessing your holy name for this, is they all get along. When you put that many talented musicians together, and they all get along, that's a statement about spiritual maturity, and that's, that's a gift. That's a gift from the Lord. So uh, I appreciate all of what you guys are doing. Your checks will be in the mail, by the way. <laughs> I'll double your pay. And you people that are singing, I appreciate you as well, because you show up and you practice and rehearse and harmonize and do things that I could never do vocally. And uh, so I appreciate what you do as well. Don't, I, want, I don't want that to go unsaid. Okay, speaking of all that, we're, we're talking about a man who, the title of this series, we're doing the parables, and we titled this, the whole series, A Man Went Out to Sow. And last week we talked about becoming good soil, bearing fruit. And that's one of the reasons I brought up a little while ago about what you can say to a person who's not a Christian about Jesus being the only person who gives in. Because these are things that we need to learn to help us bear fruit, to help us help other people 
come to a relationship with Christ. And so don't forget that. I, I'm going to move on from that. But that, ser- that sermon and that, that parable is really um, fundamental to everything that we're doing. So today's message is called Partying in Heaven. Partying in Heaven. And we're going to look at a couple of passages, Matthew 18 and Luke 15. Would you stand with me, please? In Matthew 18, significant chapter, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one? that went astray. And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. And then um, in Luke chapter 15, oh, so, excuse me. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. The font changes on those things back there once in a while. It messes me up. All right, Luke chapter 15, verses 4 through 7. So, Same parable, same basic, we'll get into that. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he's found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Father, would you add your blessing to the reading of the word? Would you help me to communicate the essence of what's on your heart from this passage that we may, your Holy Spirit may speak to us, penetrate us, utilize us and just touch us at a deep level that we would be like you in all of these things in Jesus name amen you may be seated i'm afraid i've given you the wrong impression in the last few months somebody said to me today mike i know you don't like football i like football college football uh I like football. Uh, I don't love it. I like it, especially when I need a good nap. But, uh, again, I couldn't help but mess with you on that. No, I like football. I just like, I like messing with you a little bit. And I see people, when I see people, we go to a restaurant, and these people who did not go to church they just live today to come to the restaurant and cheer for their professional football team as if they're going to get a check when that team wins or something, you know. And I think, man, this is overboard. This is crazy. You know, the Lord's going to come back on a Sunday afternoon and see these nut jobs down there cheering for something. And they didn't go to church to worship the creator of the universe, but they can go to a restaurant and worship 285-pound people that try to carry a pigskin from one end of a yard to the other. It's, it's crazy. If you ever watch the Andy Griffith's uh, stand-up thing he did many, many, many years ago, you can find it on YouTube. It's called Toys Football It Was, and he was a guy trying to discover what this was. <clears throat> anyway, let's get on with it, Mike. So beat the drum, hold the phone. The sun came out today. Born again, there's new grass on the field. Round and third, headed home with a brown-eyed, handsome man. Anyone can understand the way I feel. Put me in, coach. I'm ready to play today. Put me in, coach. I'm ready to play. Look at me. I can be center field. What does that have to do with this parable? Ah, we'll see. So there are two basic versions of this parable. One is in Matthew, when Jesus in chapter 18 
and it's two different settings, and there's overlap between them. They're not totally identical, but there's a lot of overlap. In Matthew 18, Jesus is talking about these little ones, the vulnerable ones, the, far, the people that we probably would uh, consider insignificant, that the Father does not want to lose. And so Jesus tells the parable about the man who lost the sheep and he goes out and finds them. To illustrate the fact that the Father values people regardless of whether people consider those people significant or not. And he is like a shepherd who seeks out the one who has gone astray. It's powerful. In Luke, it has a little more of an evangelistic tone. The sheep represent one sinner who repents. And the shepherd has more joy over the one sinner that repents than over the 99 who don't need to repent. Again, this is, this is just powerful imagery that Jesus uses. It's about, it's about God's attitude, and it's about our work. It's both. And in both, the shepherd rejoices more over the one that was found than over the 99 who did not need to be found. Matthew 6, or 18, 13, let's check it out. And if he finds it truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. And Luke 15, 7 says the same thing. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who need no repentance. That's powerful stuff. There's partying in heaven. So we're talking about, as we look at this passage of Scripture, we're talking about worldview here. That's a word we don't use very much, there's two words. But we're talking about worldview. We're talking about these parables are helping to define how one views the world. And particularly, how God views the world. And Jesus, through these little parables, is telling us some powerful things about God and how he views the world. And I want to pick up on some of those. And one of the first things we see is, and I don't want you to miss this, is God's intimate familiarity with each and every one of us. Think about that. See, in the Jewish mind at that time, the Jews thought that only the Jews mattered. And if you pin the Pharisees down, though they wouldn't tell you this on the street corner, but if you pin them down what they're really about, they would tell you that really only the religious elite mattered, that only they mattered. But God has a different attitude. It's a fact. God knows you intimately. He knows your name. He knows your hopes. He knows your family. He knows your dreams. He knows your needs. He knows your sin. God knows you intimately. There isn't anything about you that he doesn't know. He knows you better than you know yourself. And not only does he know you, but God knows everyone that you know. And he is intimately concerned about each and every one of them. Whether it's the homeless person on the street or it's a dignitary in a position of authority. God knows everything about everyone. He knows you and he knows them intimately. And every person, hear me now, every person matters to God. Now, I'm, I know I'm saying that in church, but there's some church, there's a man by the name of John Calvin that uh, had this idea that God had predetermined that certain people would be saved and that other people would be lost. And if God predetermined that you would be saved, there's nothing that you could do to not make that happen. And if God had predetermined that you would be one who would be lost, there's nothing that you could do that would change that. I'm not making this up. He did. But I don't see that language in Scripture. 
When the Bible says that God so loved the world, I believe it says that God loved the world. That the lost sheep, the one who goes away, matters as much to God as the 99 who are already in. In fact, he rejoices more when the one who's lost comes back than he does over the 99 who stayed put. It's amazing. So we see God's intimate familiarity with each and every one of us. But something else pops out here. And that's the urgency of finding the one that is lost. Look at this. And they're both parables the same in Matthew and Luke. The 99 are home safe and sound. But the shepherd leaves the 99 to go and find the one. What this tells, this is just powerful stuff. What this tells me is that God is not, a, God is not satisfied with the status quo. He's not satisfied that you and your children are in church. He's not satisfied that you and your friends are in church. He wants everybody. And he's not satisfied as long as anybody is left out of the fold. And there's urgency in that. The shepherd leaves the 99. Leaves the 99 and goes to find the one that was on the outside and lost. Here's something else that pops out of this. I told you I keep moving. Here's something else that pops out of this. And that is we cannot help but see the rejoicing over the one that is found. This is party language. They're celebrating in heaven. Luke says, it's, it's party language. Luke says, there's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repents than over the 99 who did not need to. When a person becomes a Christian, they're celebrating in heaven. It's powerful imagery. Heaven parties when one person buries their life in baptism and is raised to walk in newness of life. But one person who has been straying away from the Lord comes back to the Lord and, re and recommits himself to the The Bible says there's partying in heaven over that. The Lord, who's partying? Well, the question would be, who isn't partying? Now, you and I don't see it. But that doesn't mean it doesn't take place. The scripture says it does. The Lord's partying. The Lord, he gets excited. The angels, they're partying. I believe the saints have been joining in the celebration. That, the, that the heaven itself erupts in celebration when one person comes back to the Lord. Imagine that. And church people have to hurry to get out the door to go to lunch. <laughs> We're in the middle of March Madness. This is crazy, isn't it? I love basketball. I love college basketball. And uh, it's March Madness and teams are celebrating. You know, there's 68 teams in this tournament. And 67 of them are going to get their heart broken at some point. So just relax. But you know, it's when a team that wins, regardless of who there's, there's, especially the higher up they go in the tournament, you know, there's just jubilant celebration. You notice that? These men acting like little kids. And it gets crazy. The fans are going crazy, and the cheerleaders are going crazy, and the the players are going crazy, and the parents in the stands are going crazy, and it just gets crazy out there in celebration. And I kind of, th I kind of imagine that's how it is in heaven when one person comes to Christ. You know, some of you were baptized recently, and we didn't, we didn't have the opportunity to see through the curtain to the other dimension of heaven. I don't know if you know this or not, but when you were baptized, all heaven was rejoicing at what happened to you. And all of you, it's the same. The day that you gave your life to Christ, all heaven was rejoicing and celebrating. 
That's kind of God's, it's God's worldview. But you know, it's not just about God's worldview. Because this parable, these parables also talk to us about our, our worldview and how do we compare our worldview to his. And I think the point is really clear that Jesus is making. That we must adopt his attitude toward the 99 and the 1. He wants us, the reason Jesus told us this parable, not just so we could see how God views this, but so we could adopt the same attitude toward the 99 and the 1. That we would be like him in his seeking for those who are lost. Now what that means is this. On a practical scale, it means that seeking the lost must become a passion. It must become something that I'm passionate about. That there must be in my heart a sense of urgency in seeking lost sheep. I can't be, I can't be casual about this matter. I can't be indifferent about it. And by the way, did you know that the opposite of love is not hate? The opposite of love is indifference. And he's making it clear that there should be a sense of urgency in our seeking lost sheep. You ever lost anything? I'm not asking for a confession here. But have you ever lost anything? Your keys, your wallet. We had a person yesterday in the gathering where we were lost her prescription sunglasses. And we got three phone calls on that. Or text message. And all her friends got text messages. And the restaurant got text messages. There was urgency in her search for her sunglasses. And that's okay. Because when we lose something of value, we don't say, oh, I lost my keys. Well, next week sometime I'll take a look and see if I can find them somewhere. <laughs> oh, I lost my credit card. Well, it doesn't really matter. I'll just, you know. Yeah. No, there's urgency. We go and look for it. We told you our story many years ago about how we almost lost our middle daughter in a mall. And I won't go into the details. I've told the story enough. But I'm telling you, we looked intently. We didn't say, well, let's see, come back a week from now, see if they find anything, you know. We got after it. We went down every aisle, and we worked on a systematic bow went one way, and I went the other way like on a grid, and we were in an intense search to find our three-year-old. There was urgency in the search. Yes, we found her. <laughs> and this is, what, this is what Jesus is saying, that, that this matter of seeking the loss is something that that we must adopt some degree of urgency about. Because we do not know when the Lord is coming. And we are not promised tomorrow. And nobody is. So this is something that we must be about. We must be alert. We must have, look for opportunities. We must, we, must have, we must have a sense of urgency and some passion about that. It's never something that we can take for granted. Something else, that we have, but so if we have passion about it, then that leads us to the fact that if we have passion about it, that we're going to be personally engaged in the search. That we take this search personally. That it's something that we personally want to be involved in. It's not somebody else's business. It's not somebody else's problem. This is not a search that's just left for somebody who is their immediate family member or somebody's close friend. This is not a search that's just intended for somebody who's a religious person or a specialist or who has the, maybe the gift of gab or whatever. This is not something that is for somebody else. This is something for you and for me. And the, what I see in this parable is that the intensity of this search that the individual went for is telling me that's the norm. Indifference is not the norm. But being personally engaged in the search 
is the norm. Being a person who's on the lookout. Being a person who is open for opportunities and looking for opportunities because I, because I accept the responsibility personally to be engaged in the process of helping God fill his kingdom. You hear the intensity in my voice because it's worth being intense about. And Christ involved us in this search. He said to the disciples, go and make disciples of all the ethnos. Paul said that God has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So we're to have passion about this. Engaged in it personally, doing what we can to help other people come to salvation. This is the norm. But I, got, I don't want to leave that without sharing something else with you. To be engaged in this search is a great privilege. While I was writing this, at this juncture when I was writing this message, a week ago Thursday, I got a text message from my friend Andre's son, Joe. He said, Dad's alert. It won't be long. He wants you to call him and pray with him over the speakerphone. And so I did. I shared when I was earlier there, earlier in the week, I, I shared with him something that was really special. It's something that got in my head many years ago, and it's a memory that will never leave me. My heart was breaking. You get very few really good friends in life. But the reason I was able to share with him that day was because of something that happened many years before. And what came to mind when I was at the hospital a few days before that visiting him, Andre and Marilyn had begun, began coming to our church. They came to a Sunday school party. They had been going to a church that was really rigid and they were hungry, and Val invited them to our church for a friend day or something. But before that, they said, well, they we're having a Sunday school party at our house. And they said, well, we'll go to the Sunday school party, and if we like these people, then we might go to church. <laughs> Very pragmatic approach. And we were playing the spoon game. It was a little crazy there. For, they liked it. They liked it a lot. They said, I, I think we can identify with these people. And they came to church. We were using the peace treaty, which was a method of helping people understand how to come to Christ. And Andre Marilyn had allowed me to come to their house to share with them the three sessions of the peace treaty. He was of one background and she was of another and I went to their house and I shared with them. And on the third night of the peace tree, we talk about commitment to Christ and baptism. And they made the decision that they wanted to be baptized into Christ. And we're going to do it that next Sunday. They lived on the opposite side of the golf course from us in Cape Coral. And I, I distinctly, this is where my point's going. I distinctly remembered Driving home, it was an April night, the full moon, my windows were down in the car. I remember driving on those roads around that golf course, mile or so, to my house, mile and a half. And I remember driving that road slowly. And my heart was full of joy. I remember looking up and thanking the Lord. I thanked the Lord and praised Him that I, was in, that I had the privilege of working in a line of work that I helped people come into a relationship with Christ. I want you to hear that. Yeah, it's a responsibility. 
But on top of that, it's a privilege. To help lead someone to Christ is the absolute greatest privilege in life. But our worldview, if we're going to share God's worldview, means that we're also always ready to party. I love it when someone comes to Christ here and some of you wait afterwards and you want to say a word of congratulations to them or you take them to lunch or you send them a card or you give them a good word you tell them you'd be praying. I love it when we bring a new family member and the rest of us respond by saying, hey, you know, I'm with you in this. I want you to succeed. I want you to know I'm with you in this. Because, you know, I've, I've seen it at times, not recently, but I've seen it at times when people have to leave early before the invitation song is even finished, let alone started, or let alone started before, let alone finished. And I've never figured out, I've lived in Fort Myers 37 years, I've never understood what is going on that's so important in Fort Myers that a person has to leave church before they can see if someone makes a commitment to Christ. You see, it's so easy to be preoccupied with things that really just don't matter. So I hope, I hope you're ready to party. I'm going to give some hands and feet to this, and then we'll go home. I'm going to give you a little bit of application. What can you do? How do we take this passion and put it to work? A couple things. Number one. I want you to ask yourself the question, who is your one? Who is your one? Is there somebody that the Lord has put on your heart who's not a Christian? You've been thinking about them. You've been praying for them. Who is your one? I'm going to ask you to take their name before the Lord God himself, the Almighty And ask him to open doors for conversation. Ask him to open their heart that they'd be receptive to Christ. Who is your one? You have somebody, I know you have somebody who you care about or you've met that is is not yet a Christian. Who is your one? Pray for them. Pray for them daily that God would open a door for you to have a conversation with them. And then also like this, this, this cuts another way as well. Say, Lord, who is my one today? Before you leave your house, ask the Lord to put somebody in your path this day who you might be able to share a good word with about Christ. God, would you just orchestrate, would you create that divine appointment? God's able to do great things. Ask him to put somebody in your path every day that you might be able, and and Lord, help me to have eyes to see it when it happens. That I might be able to say a good word to about Jesus. Put me in, coach. I'm ready to play today. Put me in. I can play center field. Father, I pray that you would use us to find the one. Help us, Father, to be personally engaged and passionate in the search for those who do not yet know Jesus. Help us to accept this as a personal responsibility. But Lord, we know that you had the power that it's not up to us. We are the vine, you are the branches. We can do nothing apart from you and that your power, and you're able to do far more than we ask or imagine by your power that is at work within us. So Father, lead us in this great search. Lead us to the one. In Jesus' name, amen. And friend, maybe that's where you are today. Maybe you're ready to come back home to the Lord. And if you are, we're going to sing this song.
and it's an opportunity for you to come and surrender your life to Christ. Let's stand and sing.